Welcome back to the Beat the Often Path podcast. I'm your host, Ross Palmer. On this show, we showcase unusual success stories, often with a slant towards the entrepreneurial and the creative. Eve Anna Manley is quite simply a powerhouse. She's the owner of Manley Laboratories, a well-known professional audio and audiophile company in Chino, California. They're best known for building high-end audio equipment using vacuum tubes, including their famous reference cardioid microphones, which gained popularity after being used by major artists such as Etta James, Avril Lavigne, Katy Perry, Maroon 5, Shania Twain, and many of the world's top voiceover talent, including Don LaFontaine, who was known for his In a World trailer. Eve Anna Manley took a sabbatical from her studies at Columbia University, and she ended up staying in California, where she now owns and runs one of the most well-known companies for high-end audio in the world. Not only that, but she's a super great, down-to-earth person with a lot of incredible insights about building and running a successful business. Many years ago, my wife and I invested in our first Manly Reference cardioid microphone, which we could barely afford, and that single purchase changed our lives dramatically. So I'm honored and humbled that she's here on my podcast today. So with that, Ivana Manley of Manly Laboratories. Thank you for joining me on the podcast today. Hello, how's it going? For our listeners, the reason why I invited you here is because I've been a huge fan of your products for years and years and years. I bought a Manly Reference cardioid microphone, I don't even know when, let's say 10 10 years ago. I'm not sure. Um, It was the first serious microphone that I ever purchased. Um, It was a huge jump up in price. You know, my wife and I, I think she was my girlfriend at the time. She's a singer, songwriter. And we had been doing everything with, say, like a $300, some cheap studio projects mic. So Uh the idea of investing, you know, a couple thousand dollars into a microphone was major for us at that time uh, and a decision that we didn't take lightly. But, you know, we'd seen the reviews. Obviously, we had seen people like Avril Lavigne in the studio and Dr. Luke and all of these people who are using this microphone. So we bit the bullet. We did it. And, you know, one of the best decisions that we ever made. Um, Just loved it. You know, we used it exclusively. I still have it. It's right there on the other side of that uh, vocal booth. So I just thought, you know, uh, you might not have known this, but I've actually visited the factory a little while ago, um, not a, maybe like a year ago, because I needed a new a tube replacement for the mic. Right. So I got a chance to tour it, and I saw this just awesome American business. Just everything was right. It was like, check, check, check. So when it came time to do this podcast, I was like, I know exactly who I want to ask. So that's why Thank you're you. here. <laughs> I'm really honored. I didn't know that whole backstory, and I'm really yeah. to know. That's great. Thanks, Ross. So it's not just a random coincidence or I didn't just Google businesses. Um, but, you know, <laughs> I, I think there's so many cool things that you're doing. So maybe just tell us a bit, like, give us, you know, the elevator pitch. Who are you? What do you do? And about the company. Yeah, man, I've been uh, I, I've been doing this since 1989, actually. That's when I first started um, on the production line, learning how to build tube amps. I didn't know a damn thing about electronics. I was uh, what you call a proverbial band geek. You know, I, okay. I played yep. saxophone and clarinet and a little bit of trumpet, but I, I, and I, I love math and sciences and art and all that. And as it turned out, what I do, you know, building electronics and designing things um, and creating and producing this gear, it's like the perfect combination of my innate talents or things I was interested in, you know. So uh, that's that's like how I fell into this. Um, wow. Or, or kind of, it's more like why I fell into it. Yeah. But there's a, a bigger backstory to that. I was I was at Columbia University uh, getting my BA in music, and I was running out of money. I knew I had to go. My dad wasn't going to be able to cover uh, cover my expenses and my sister's at the same time. So. That was one motivation to take a semester off and drive across the country and uh, try to figure something out, you know, work-wise. And, um, but secondly, one day in my class was the great Bill Graham, who was a concert promoter. He pretty much, you know, started the San Francisco scene in late sixties and all that. And his son was in my class and he, he was teaching class that day. And that, that was the other part. It's like, well, I'm going to drive across the country and go find him and talk my way into a job. That was my plan. (laughs) And you drove all the way across the country. You came all the way to California. 
Yeah, I drove in wow. my 69 Volkswagen Beetle. Oh, and, my um, God. But as it turned out, I, I stopped in L.A. to visit some friends. And my my dad, my stepdad, um, he had owned Ampeg in the late 60s. And he gave me a couple names of some ex-employees, you know, that had worked for him, you know, 20 years prior, right? Mm. And this is 1989. And I called the first guy. He didn't pick up the phone. And I called the second guy. This is before cell phones and pagers and all that, right? <laughs> right. Um, like I called episode, the second yeah. guy. And he uh, put me in touch with David and Luke Manley, two South Africans building tube amplifiers out in Chino. And I'm like, that sounds very strange. Mm. <laughs> so yes. I, I, I went and interviewed and... Uh, got hired on the spot to, uh, you know, be an assistant and just start learning how to solder basically. <laughs> and, and how, how old was the company at that point? Was it officially a company or just a side hustle kind of thing? No, that was the, the first, um, company called vacuum tube logic of America. And okay. at the time we were only building high fidelity, you know, audiophile power amps, tube amps and, um, a couple of preamplifiers and the Manly brand um, was born out of that company initially as like an upper echelon, higher quality that could be debated, but um, <laughs> a second brand, because at the time they were shipping like pallets of tube right. amplifiers to places like Hong Kong and wow. Taiwan. And so if they could have two importers, at the same time, one with the VTL brand and one with the Manly brand. Well, that's why the Manly brand was in, was started. And then, Whoa. but um, just at that time, David had won a design competition um, from the Scientologists. Actually, they they mm. they uh, were looking for a bunch of mic preamps and had solicited him and some other, you know semi-famous designers at the time in the 80s to submit some designs. And then they ended up choosing David. So all of a sudden we got an order for 60 mic priests. And then suddenly what? the Manly Pro Audio division was born. So that, wow. that was the genesis of that. And now, you know, it's it's like 85 or 90 percent of what we do is pro audio uh, versus audiophile stuff. Now, what did you study at Columbia? What was your degree Music. in? Music. Okay, so, Mostly so nothing, not, not like engineering. No, when I degree. went back okay. to finish my degree, I, I, um, I took a year of college physics, and um, I tried to take some classes I thought would be useful to me in mm -hmm. my career. Mm -hmm. um, not that, that that was, I mean, I just think back on that. It's like, okay, economics is not account accounting. I should have taken accounting <laughs> or yes. some kind of business thing. I, I didn't even, yes. I didn't know anything, you know. Right. That was that. And I was, uh, I was just like 20, 21 years old when all oh that was going down. Did you consider down. yourself, did, did you consider yourself um, an audiophile at that time? Or was this just something that was new to you? Um, when I walked in the first day, um, to interview at this little tube amplifier factory, I, I looked at all these things on the shelves. I'm like, what are those? And, uh, the guys were like, Oh, those are vacuum tube mono blocks. I'm like, what? <laughs> I had no yeah. idea. I, I was, a, you know, a vinyl collector and I had just, you know, started collecting compact disc at the time in the eighties. And I totally researched, you know, mid fight separates, you know, like a receiver and mm. set deck and little Technics turntable, and, yeah. you know, that kind of thing. And I, I did purchase, you know, I did, I didn't buy like a rack system like you used to find in the department stores. You, you know, that was like m what most, most people were buying as far as mid fight went. It's like right. you would get a Fisher rack, you know, it was a yeah, receiver. Right. And, my my dad had a stack All like the that. Same I, brain. I was like, yeah, right. So I I mean I wasn't an audiophile per se, but I was I was starting for for the world I knew about, which was like Stereo Review Magazine and mm -hmm. Audio Magazine. Um, 
I, I bought the best stuff I could figure out how to buy for the, wow. for the price too. I mean, I worked, you know, summer jobs yeah. and, um, uh, you know, bought a saxophone and bought yeah. a hi-fi system. <laughs> so yeah, the answer is sort of, yeah. Sort of kind of. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Well, and at this point it's, it's, Three people, literally, this company is just the three, or or there more people already? Well, no, there, I was working alongside the assembly people, okay. and I quickly realized, oh, dang, I took French in college and high school. I should have taken Spanish. <laughs> so okay. Out here, was, yeah. That was the last class I took when I went back to finish my degree. Wow. The last class was Spanish. And so then Pablo Espanol ahora mismo. Okay, that's good. Yeah. <laughs> and 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 three years after you started, you became the head of the company. Is that right? Or well, yeah. What what was not happening at the time was there wasn't a lot of business organization, and I okay. just sort of um, kind of figured it out on my own, and also based on my high school job, like I re I remember seeing some kind of purchasing system and some kind of inventory system all on paper back then. Right. We didn't, yeah. we barely had a computer, I think. But, right. um, so the, the first purchasing system, cause what would happen is, you know, as a builder, um, at the time someone would say, Hey, here's a, a copy, you know, an example, go build 20 of those boards. And it's like, okay. Mm. And then you, you go into the, the inventory area and um you know you'd look at your copy and say well i think i need uh one two three four you know eight of these uh let's see what color is that okay 10 kilohertz i need a couple of these yeah, i need eight of these resistors you go find one and maybe there would be seven in the bin and so you'd take one of the last ones and you couldn't finish your build because you'd have to go show it to Luke and say, Hey, we need more of this thing, you know? Right. And then maybe a week later, um, you still can't finish the boards because the resistors aren't there. Hey, did you order those resistors? It's like, Oh darn, I forgot. You know, so there wasn't oh, even a lot. Everything grinds to a halt. Oh, yeah. My God. So that yeah, was like, sense. that was one example of like, I mm. took a ruler out in a, got on the copy machine and drew out like a purchasing log book for, mm. for the company. So th those kind of systems, I, I just built them uh, out of just self logic. I guess I wasn't really okay. referring to much. And then later right. those systems became um, Excel spreadsheets and then later sure. became uh, more advanced uh, databases, you know? So, wow. I had an innate knack for like organizing things or finding problems or discover uncovering problems that I could engineer a solution for. So as far as running the company, yeah, by the time we split with VTL and Manly moved to its a separate location, I was running the whole factory at that point and wow. yeah, managing all that stuff. Amazing. So yep. how many products did you have at that time? What were you selling? Too many. It was just such Too chaos. <laughs> wow. I mean, it was, Seems there was a lot. Just... And, um, David Manley, as it tur turned out was, um, later, much later diagnosed after he left the company, he was, um, diagnosed with, uh, bipolar disorder. And oh, so man. when he was in the manic mode, all of a sudden there's just all these new designs, like he, he could get a lot of stuff done. Um, but the problem, and I was like a design assistant at the time in doing quality control. The problem was like a lot of these designs were just rushed and half baked and not really mm. tested. They weren't beta tested and they might have a lot of hum in them or barely function the way they're supposed to or something like that. And, um, so a lot of my technical chops were built during that time of kind of fixing up stuff that was actually in production. <laughs> oh my <laughs> you know, god! Already, and customers like, "Hey, this thing's noisy." I'm like, "Yeah, yeah no." <laughs> wow. You know and, and, what I'm saying? So. And what was the customer base? Who who was buying this? So you you just had a steady stream, or was there difficulty? Because it was it just kind of word of mouth, or we were starting to 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 build 
uh, a dealer network around the world and both, you know, Hi-Fi and Pro Audio Worlds. And um, we'd go to the trade shows. We, we used to do NAB and AES and we'd do shows overseas and go visit people overseas. So we were, we were doing all that outreach early on. I, you had wow. you had to get the noise out. There was no social media back then. There was no right. there was no World Wide Web back then. You know what I mean? Yeah. So, wow. yeah, that Those is were incredible. The heady well, times. I, I can imagine. I've always wanted to know. You know, when you have an idea. I mean, this is how ignorant I am. So let's say you want to build a microphone. How how does that conversation go? You just say one day. You know, I think we're gonna make a microphone, and then what do you? I mean, how do you go from these ideas? to any kind of product it can go in different ways like um in the past like david or other designers that were working with us you know would just decide they want to do something and they'd go off into their lab and come back months later with okay we're going to build this and and then you know we'd analyze what it cost to build and then set set a retail price it's like oh man shit, this thing's very expensive. We're never going to sell many of these, you know, and learn that afterwards. Right. Well, we don't do that anymore. So what we do now is, you know, study market conditions, like what what kind of product uh, could we sell a bunch of that we're not making right now or so on, and go survey the marketplace and say, mm. oh, well, that company's got, wow, that one's only 1,800. Wow, that's fierce competition. Hmm. Yeah. Maybe if we try to, you know, make our thing like 2,200 bucks, we can compete yeah. with that. Okay. How are we going to get from here to there? Right. So sure. it's it these days what I am looking at the marketplace and deciding like price wise where I think we can fit in. And then we design to meet that price in the old days, it was done the opposite. And, and consequently, um, some of those older products that are very cumbersome to put together and very expensive, mm -hmm. you know, are not that profitable because I, I can't just, I, I can't charge what we actually should get for them because mm. then they'd be sky high prices. So maybe we'll call those lost leaders at this point. <laughs> that makes sense. Yeah. yeah. But yeah, these days we do a more advanced um, study and also we, we've got way better organization and more people on the team working on in the design cycle. And then there's, there's also like modern tools that we use for communication, um, like having weekly, you know, engineering meetings. Well, we used to do it in person around a big table, but right. now we do it on, on zoom or Google meets or something like that. Um, yeah. we use monday.com as well for mm. kind of centralized, uh, company communication as well. Mm, yeah, that may, and you know, I know actually here, I have something for you. Check this out. Ah, you've got a <laughs> do-rag. Awesome. <laughs> That's right. And it says tubes rule, right? <laughs> they, Vacuum they tubes. Do. So to what, <laughs> to what Sometimes degree? they don't, but mostly <laughs> they do. <laughs> what, <laughs> what role do the tubes play? Maybe give, give some insights for the people who might not know. What are these tubes? Why is it different? What the hell than, is a tube anyway? Yeah, why do right, they and, and why well, is it good? Uh, why desirable? And why is it worth the hassle? Yeah, they they can totally be a hassle, let me tell you. But um, anyway, vacuum tubes are a, a device or are devices that amplify audio. We'll just keep it simple like that. And they they were invented, you know, a hundred years ago or something like that. Right. And they have a couple characteristics that make them very well suited for audio and very pleasing sounding. Like they're like, you know, most people are going to be playing a vacuum tube guitar amplifier because why, when you push it and the voltage sags and the tubes start distorting, they do so in a very pleasing way, a very desirable way. Right. Mm -hmm. So that's like, that's one thing. And another thing they work on really high ranges. So, um, they have a lot of headroom. So, you know, mm -hmm. you can put a lot of signal through there and, the, and 
they won't clip <laughs> unless like you design it so they will like a guitar amp um the way right. our designs are you know kind of opposite of guitar amplifiers because we're trying to get a lot of he- clean headroom and mm-hmm. and not impart too much um tone or color into the sound mm-hmm. and tubes can be really clean sounding and not that colored you know some of the components or sometimes people think of this tube sound of being like kind of warm and rich and maybe a little dull on the top old school old fashioned old school, yeah. but mm-hmm. a lot of a lot of that sound of those sonic characteristics actually can come into the circuit from the transformers or mm. uh, maybe like um, older power supply designs or something like that you know so the tube itself is quite a linear device and also is very forgiving like where you use it on that linear range it has a wide range you know you can run it at 100 volts or 180 volts and you're still going to be in a linear range for example you know what i mean sure so they're quite forgiving to work with and the uh the irony is that the reference cardioid and i think all of that line they're known for being among the bright uh, on the brighter end of such microphones i mean there's it's that sheen that people are paying so much for, I think, right? Yeah. That I sparkle, tell you, really. Um, I'll just introduce my power oh, yes. supply behind Please me here. Do. This yes. is a that's a switch mode power supply. Okay. And it's giant. It was um <laughs> designed for us by Bruno Putzis, who's a brilliant audio designer out there, and he he specializes in switch mode power supply design. And I was talking to him at a show one day because we'd become buddies and i'm like yeah bruno man could you like do one of these nifty power supplies like but really high voltages like what we need for vacuum tubes he's like yeah i don't see why not so i i was able to hire him to design this awesome power supply and in the listening test i in i'll do this i'll build a unit with the switch mode power supply and build you know compare it to the existing unit with the linear supply and they're not plug and play. You have to do a few circuit modifications to make them both work the way they're supposed to. But um, man, last time I, I took uh, one of our Chinook, two of our Chinook phono stages down to mastering studio in LA and we listened to them on records that, that Pete had cut right there. And it was the top end that was like really clean and it had that sheen in that beautiful an ending top end to it, you know, definitely yeah. not dull or rolled off. And then combine that with how quiet it is and, you know, the spaces in between the notes and your mm-hmm. sense of space and just quiet groove on the tracks, man, it was, it was remarkable. Like the, the sonic difference between the two power supply topologies and designs were, it's remarkable. When you get to wow. hear it, a B like that, you're like, "Holy cow, that's a I'm that's sure. freaking amazing!" So, that is um, really something. So I'm trying to, trying to get this power supply into like everything we're building. So the Vox Box is up Makes next. Sense. Okay, wow. We're so, working you know, on for, that next. For the people who don't know anything about audio out there, um, obviously people have heard many enormous records that have manly products all over them. What what are a rundown of some of the more famous clientele or records or I know it's a long list, but maybe so many. Just, and some, just so people get a of sense our, of the gravity here. Dude, like some of my favorite artists are no longer with us. Like I, I got mm. to work with Ray Charles and I built him a, a custom manly compressor limiter, variable mu, yeah. you know, with a special layout and let him pick out the knobs he wanted and stuff like that, you know, so it'd make it easy for him to use. So his last record, he used that. Um, it was present. I mean, I'm not going to claim total, <laughs> total. Uh, I mean, Genius's company. That record is is not just the manly variable view. It's everything <laughs> right. else too, including the talent. Um, but of it course. didn't hurt. It didn't hurt. That's right. Do no harm. Mm-hmm. Um, Etta James. She she uh, owned uh, say, yeah. a manly reference cardioid mic. Her last I've heard couple some of those records. records. Yeah. And she bought some other gear from me for her studio out in Riverside. I got to hang, hang out with her a couple of times. It was really, she was pretty amazing. Right. Totally crazy, but fun. <laughs> I guess it makes sense. Sure. 
Do you know who, who's a, a user of our mics for the last 15, 20 years? Is Michael McDonald. Hmm. And, uh, I didn't bought, know that. He bought some Manly Gold mics. And also I built a special version of our electro-optical limiter, our Manly L-op limiter. Um, yeah. And I'm just ever always so proud when I see him singing in front of one of our mics because uh, he's yeah. one of the best vocalists ever to live, right? Just yes. a, a remarkable talent and such a great guy too. And um, David Bowie had Manly Gold Mike. He used that for his last couple records, I believe. I'm, I'm sure they used all kinds of stuff, but mm-hmm. I don't know. Those are some of the, I mean, and then so, you mentioned before Dr. Luke. So all that pop stuff, the, the pop stuff. Yeah. The, Katy Perry and Kesha and all that. Um, yep. I've been recording on the Manly reference cardioid mic for, I think also about 20 years he said that might too. I so yeah, yeah. I mean, it, it's great for that because of the top end. You get you don't even have to EQ it. It just it has that sparkle naturally. If anything, you have to maybe reduce the highs, which is kind of the opposite of like a a Neumann or like a U87, you know, those more like rounded type microphones or whatever, but uh Yeah, the, the sound is spectacular. The Manly reference gold mic is actually a little more kind of audiophile or clean sounding more neutral sounding interesting that would be your your sony um c800 killer would be the gold mic it's a a little little brighter than that you know wow so like to what degree are you referencing obviously you know there are tons of different brands some you know some cheap some very very expensive um to what you said you started with ideas you know you, you look at a price point perhaps and you think we need something in this range how important is it to know what the competition is doing or do you just say we're just going to make the best sounding thing that we can and you know hope for the best in that regard well like like i said you know we we've deployed different strategies for mm-hmm. product planning before i mean when i did the vox box that was kind of a new product category at the time the the avalon 737 was doing really well out there being a, a combination of mic preamp, EQ, compressor, or some kind of dynamic range control. Mm -hmm. So that product, David had just left the company, and um, we were in the throes of getting divorced and all that. And so the Voxbox, there was quite an emotional content there for me Mm -hmm. because that was my first solo project Mm -hmm. without him, right? Yeah. Yeah. I was able to channel that anger, you know, about getting divorced <laughs> and everything sure. to, you know, revenge through success, basically. Wow. You know what I mean? So yes. I was like, the motivation there was definitely like, well, I'm going to, I'm going to make this totally awesome combo unit. And yeah, I'm going to borrow some existing circuits out of products that we make right now but I'm going to add a little bit to each one of them to make, make the combo unit better than the combination of all the separates as a big wow. old F you man, <laughs> <laughs> we're going to rock without you. Cause he, cause you know, he was a bit of a narcissist as well. And you know, he, he was like hoping that we would fail without him. Right. And sure. This really, we can think of other uh, present day figures that are kind of like that. <laughs> oh, I, I can't um, draw any conclusion. <laughs> I don't know what you're talking about. Um, so, you know, I knew that he was in France, like hoping that, that I would be a big failure and he mm-hmm. would be the big winner, right. Of nothing. Um, so, you know, the revenge through success thing, that was one way to really get to him. <laughs> wow. He's and, no and succeed on the now. And succeed anyway, you did. But it yeah. benefited everybody. It, ben- it even benefited him that we did well because I was able to buy him out of the company, obviously. Okay. So, well, that's good. Every when that's the thing, I never understood that. Like, I'm always wishing for all of my friends' successes and all the, my competition's successes around me. You know what I mean? Because we're all yeah. stronger as an industry. We're all stronger together. We're stronger as a community. And um, 
you know, it's just, I, I can't understand people that just walk around the planet just wishing for doom on everyone else. It's, yeah. it's kind of, it, I don't know. It's an illness for sure. Definitely. It's a big myth. Yeah. It's a big myth that other people have to fail for you to succeed. Yeah. It, it's not, it's not true at all. I don't believe it's, it's true. true at all. Yeah. You know, I like this power supply here. Right. You know, that came about from becoming friends with another audio gear manufacturer, right? Mm. And then getting to work together. And so on, like the the universal audio plugins, same thing. Mm -hmm. Like, you know, oh, we're fierce competition, building, you know, optical limiters or whatever, <laughs> or mic pre's. And but right. then, you know, when the opportunity came for them to approach me and say, Hey, can we license some manly stuff and do plugins? It's like, of course. And that came from being friends first, right? Mm. Meeting it at trade shows. So yeah. definitely. Yeah. The success of everyone around you is something that each and every one of us should be rooting for. That's so cool. I love that. And, and flash forward to today. Um, what's the snapshot of the company? Manly today? How many employees? What do things look like right now? Has, has it been hard with the pandemic or has not We're much exhausted, changed? exhausted, man. We've been yeah. working so hard this year. Um, yeah. We had our biggest year ever. Oh, and wow. Congratulations. You'll find, you'll find this story around the audio industry because when the pandemic hit and everyone got sent home and could not go to a recording studio, Doing stuff yeah. like this. <laughs> people, people were rushing to to set up some kind of systems in their in their some kind of recording systems in their house. That's and also point. for these these zooms and all this kind of thing. Mm -hmm. Um and everyone upgraded, you know, lots of audio and video equipment at the same time. And then musicians I saw like because they couldn't go to the studio and all record an orchestra, so they would send the music out to all the musicians, everyone would record at home, send back the tracks and um, they could, you know, work on them electronically and add room reverb and, and mix them in. And it's a whole, mm -hmm. it's a different way of working that's been, you know, really accelerated by the pandemic. So those of us that had a good year this year in 2020, it's, it's because we were able to spin on a dime and adapt and solve problems, it, which were many, you know, and um, be able to like send homework home with our builders when they couldn't come to the factory so they could work from home or, you know, um, change the, you know, layout at, at the factory and not, or schedules and not have people, you know, too many people there at one time, that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. Also, like a lot of people, a lot of us don't care if it's the weekend anymore. <laughs> you know, yeah. it's like every day is a work day. Oh, yeah. And um, we're we're working all the freaking time and adapting mm -hmm. uh, and adopting these new technologies that allow us all to work from afar and work together. And personally, I feel way more connected to all my friends and everybody. Mm. Um this past year than before because it, it's like video conference to video conference like we're yes. in each other's faces and i think we're actually communicating more as mm. as a people as wow. a species you know what i mean i think this is really um enhanced communication with people being sent home it's kind of it's strange but that's yeah. what i think sometimes I'm like really happy to not talk to people for a day. <laughs> sure. Yeah. Do, do you feel yeah. that you'll go back? Let's say, okay, tomorrow pandemic's over vaccine. Everybody has it. It's all good, which may never happen, but let's say that it does happen. Are you going to have some permanent changes in the company? Are you going to do things differently because of how it's been? Um, or is I it think just I'll, back to the way I'd it was? Live. I live, I personally live 35 miles away from the factory. So I, okay. I don't, I don't run the day to day operations mm -hmm. in the factory um, anymore. That's Gamma's job. He, I used to do that. And I've, I've got an awesome dude who does that. We've worked together for over 25 years. So 
he has to be there every day because he's got his hands rolled up. I'm doing more. I've transitioned more into an executive role, um, but I still get my hands dirty with the, you know, service department, make sure people are being treated right. And we're taking care of them and, and lending some insight. You know, I've got some new people working for me and Mm -hmm. they need to, you know, learn, learn about the history of the gear and stuff. And sometimes I I will be able to offer some insight that they might not have yet. That kind of thing. So um, my, my day-to-day job is, you know, video conferences. We have sales meetings, we have marketing meetings, we have engineering meetings. The production team has production meetings to go over issues. And, um, and then, uh, yeah, I'm just typing a lot of emails. <laughs> it's yeah. Mainly what I do. I've been getting some tendonitis myself. So much computer usage. It's crazy. Yeah. I found, um, you know, every couple of years I need to change whatever mouse device I'm using. These days I've that's got smart. this awesome, um, I don't know if oh that. yeah, that's I it, need one of those. Ver- it's a vertical it's, mouse. You're like this, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. I need so one of those. It's you're rotated. You know, this is conventional mouse, and right. then this one, it's like a in your hands in the position of a, a handshake instead of this like is, this. It's supposed, supposed to be much to be, easier. Yeah, I think that's yeah. that's something I've got to work on. I changed that a couple of years ago because okay. I was in so much pain with my forearm. It's like yeah, tennis. That's it. Yeah, that's exactly what I have. It's been creeping yeah, dude, up the last one. It. This one, okay. uh, the brand's called e- Evoluent. Okay. Evoluent. Um, you can get them on Amazon or whatever. But I love it. it. It's nice. Great. So, so, really so when it's all awesome. when it's all over, everybody back to the office. I mean, not you, of course. Everybody else, or do you think, hey, this there's something to this? We can just keep working like this. Um, combination. I, I think some. Some of us working remotely are probably more efficient working from home, just mm-hmm. not having folks like walking in your office every 10 minutes. Yep. That, that I used to work from home like half the when I lived out in Chino, I used to work from home half the day and deal with all my correspondence and then mm-hmm. be in the factory that later half of the day. And because, you know, people have questions, they just want to jump in and, you know, ask the question. So, and sometimes even interruption, like with a text message or a phone call or something, is the same kind of distraction from what mm. you're concentrating on. So overall, we're trying to train each other to not be so impulsive mm. and to, you know, a, to make an agenda and address these issues in a meeting or centralize that communication, like I mentioned, like on Monday.com, mm-hmm. um, where everyone on the team can see it and you're not forgetting to include somebody like on an email chain or something mm-hmm. like that. So mm-hmm. we've, we've evolved, I think, in, and improved in our communication strategies this year. And those things, those need to continue because we've made some mm-hmm. good inroads there. Um, the workers, um, you know, we've got a lot of space in the factories. There's about 20 people that are there every day. Okay. But in uh, that's a lot. Yeah, in December we we finally got our first cases, and um, actually half of those twenty people caught COVID, probably oh mostly God. from Thanksgiving family hangouts. Just just now, you mean like a couple of weeks ago? Oh or yeah. Last. Oh okay. Oh my. No. Goodness. Yeah. Seriously, like some that's of our terrifying. guys oh, are through the ten day. You know, some people are suffering really badly. Yeah. And. Some some of the guys like didn't even know they had it and have zero symptoms, but That's would horrifying. have been, you know, would have been contagious. Uh, the good thing right. is, you know, like I said, we adapted these safety protocols super early, mm. and for the most part, the guys, my workers, have been really good mentally about you know hygiene, wearing masks, and not being near each other. But sometimes they need reminding. Like yeah. I was out there two months ago and. There were, you know, unrelated people sitting in the lunchroom eating lunch. And I'm like, hey, w- you can't do this. <laughs> this yeah. room is too small for you guys to yeah. be in here right now together. Because yeah. we've put picnic t- tables outside. And, you know, it's 10,000 square feet. You can spread out um, mm-hmm. all over the place and be far. And, the, you know, they're like 
20 foot ceilings or 24 foot ceilings or whatever. So there's a lot of right. space to get away from people there. And sometimes we have to remind the workers like, Hey, uh, do you forget this pandemic and, uh, yeah. you, you can't be sitting in here right now. So, so true. anyway, um, that's the current, current state of things is we, oh my goodness. we've had a lot of scrambling to do in the last couple of weeks. Um, with, you know, a couple folks got infected and they got sent home and then we sent everybody home to get retested and they had to, you know, wait a couple days uh, for negative results to be able to come back mm -hmm. in, the ones that could come back in. But then, so it sounds then like a really just, positive way to go to the holidays, right? <laughs> yeah, then it just kind of melded sure. into the holidays oh, and, no. you know, we're here we are. So, sure. or what day is it? It's good question. The 21st, 22nd, Tuesday? I think. Yeah. <laughs> You're like, it's, it's some not of Christmas us just yet, don't, don't think. care. <laughs> it's, it's somewhere around what just, used to be called Christmas. It's just another day, exactly. It's just another day. Another you day. know, what, one of the things that I, that I wanted to ask before we got on this call was, as you know, people in the audio world, they're very finicky, let's just say, very particular people in general, especially musicians, probably more so than almost any other group of people. Um, so, yeah. you know, if, if you think about like a tech company like Apple, every year they release a new iPhone and that's what people want. They want the newest, latest, greatest thing. But in audio where people are still mixing on Oratone speakers and NST, <laughs> you know, people find a sound, they latch onto it, and then they just kind of want that sound for the rest of their life. How do you innovate when you're dealing with the thought that if I change anything about this microphone or this preamp or whatever, that people are going to scream because it's not exactly like the old one? Like, do you just not do that or, or what? How does that go? Well, um, like this power supply, uh, a year ago, we made a special 30th anniversary production run of the Manly Reference Cardioid mic engineered to work off of this power supply, off of the Manly Power. And um, we decided to do it for all the great benefits that that power supply has over a linear power supply. And some of the benefits are very boring, like um, we don't have to keep 120 volt stock or 100 volt stock or 240 volt stock for different countries, like one size fits all, and it works all over the world. That's, that's great. Very, that's very boring on our side, but what's exciting for the customer is the customer can now travel anywhere around the world and just plug it in and not think about it because it's huge. It, it is because like younger people sometimes don't even realize that there are different voltages in the world because it's like, well, my, my iPhone charger works everywhere. What do you mean? Yeah. Why did this blow up when I plugged it in in France? You know, <laughs> it's yes. like because it was set for 120 and you need 220. So um, it's it's just like really convenient and all that stuff. And then, OK, so why why do we go ahead with it? Well, we do listen to it, don't we? So we listen to it and um, everything sounds a little better. It's not a in the microphone. There's probably also just a little bit of variation in the capsules, you know, mm. one to another where the difference of the power supply was, was less than the difference maybe between two different microphones, mm. Más o menos, you know? Yeah. Right. So we, it wasn't this giant improvement, like on some of the, I don't know, some of, some of the other gear, like I can really hear that difference mm. on the microphones. I, it's a little more subtle to my ears, at least. Someone else might listen to a linear versus switcher. I mean, provided that the two capsules are identical, which you got to select through, but suppose we had two identical capsules. Well, maybe someone else would hear that power supply difference and be like, holy cow, no, you're, you're totally underselling it. <laughs> it's awesome. Maybe. So anyway, you know, we, I, I'm very careful about changing that reference cardioid mic because it is our best-selling product and mm -hmm. and it's famous for what it is and I don't want right. to mess with success. But in this case, it was a, a good improvement and we 
we later, a few months later, we were able to to stop production of the linear power supplies altogether for the gold mic also. And so oh, now wow. all three microphones are running the exact same power supply in cabling. In, Very the cool. silver mic was all, always had that power supply. Okay. Always had yeah, because that's, that's new. Now, yeah. do you do you ever think, I mean, one of the biggest, you, you talked about a lot of people capturing content these days, a lot of musicians. Um, do you ever think about shifting at all into the world of location sound or film sound, like making a boom mic or shotgun mic or lavaliers? Is that on the radar or is that like, nope, just, we don't touch that world? It's just something I, I just don't have any personal experience in, in that mm. world myself. Um, you know, same like with the, guitar amplifier world like i'm not a guitar player so i haven't <laughs> right. i haven't really you know stretched in because that's a whole different market as well um it's not to say we won't do something there in um but it's like priorities are like you i guess one can kind of stick to what they're familiar with <laughs> makes sense well i just yeah. asked because i think if you were to do that i'm sure it would be outstanding but i completely understand Thanks. yeah that i mean i'm sure you could contribute something the, we probably will at some point you know but you yeah chose. it's gonna be awesome i i totally don't want to put out mediocre yeah. products of any kind that's that's just where we're at in this high quality world you know true really great sounding gear well, and it's it's interesting that also in this world, I think, you know, the negative side is people are very picky and finicky, but the positive side is that, you know, it's really about what something does for you more than what it is, which I find is a fascinating concept. Like if I if I want to capture a podcast, I don't use the tube mic for something like this because I value my tubes so much, so I don't want to. Uh, I'm not going to waste precious tube juice on a podcast, oh, but please do. <laughs> You think so? Please do. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I know, I know you guys are excellent. Yeah, going, he's not get, that expensive. He's just a 12AX7 in there. You okay. Know, it, it, well, I, as long as I'm pay close. More to select through a bunch yes. to get a really quiet one for microphones, but, mm. you know, just buy a spare tube. You're good. Okay. Okay. Fair <laughs> enough. <laughs> Maybe I'll swap it out for the next one. Yeah. I, mean, I leave my computer on but, all the time. You know? uh, yeah. Ugh, and then oh, the God. battery swells up and I can't use my trackpad. <laughs> you can't take it on a plane either. No, no. <laughs> You're a fire hazard. Oh, no. I know it. It's crazy. But huh? it's, you know, it's, it's about what these things make people do like at the end of the day if the record sells then the microphone is good enough or if the emotion comes through then it's it's good enough so that's that's where i think you know if you want to capture sound it just needs to do the job that it's supposed to do and that would be either let's say dialogue or, or vocal or uh, guitar or any kind of instrument you know it just has to do what it's supposed to do and i i think that is something that that is unique about the music world like you know people don't care what it looks like as long as it works right or what it oh, costs no, they care. as long as it works if there's oh, a so, okay. scratch <laughs> maybe, on maybe the unit or something they oh, yeah. get the, our you know fussy customers yeah. they're yeah. also going to be the looking world. like hey the audio there's files a scratch are a different on this breed. unit i want yeah. a 300 dollars discount you know it's like sure. oh, God damn it. um but you know you talk about emotion i mean that that's yeah. the ultimate listening test for me. So when we're working on whatever, I tell a story when I was working on my Stingray power amp. Um, we, we had uh, an EL84 circuit. That's a vacuum tube output tube type. And I remembered at the time the, the review we had gotten in stereophile was like, well, it's a nice little amp, but it's just got no bass. And I was mm. thinking like, well, that's not the tubes fault. The tube's right. going to give you all the frequencies. Whose fault is this? Well, it's probably the output transformer. Let's have a look at that. So we were we worked up a new design, and you know we we make our transformers, our audio transformers at Manly Labs. We don't buy them from another company. We make them. So mm. um, we ran up a design. We measured on the audio precision. You could say. You know, it's like, okay, yeah, see, we raise the inductance and then we get way more power out at 20 hertz or whatever. And look at this. So distortion looks good. No ringing. Great. Um, let's listen to it. And so like that first time we listened to it, I remember, you know, the old one that had you no know, versus the new one that had great measuring base. 
but it just didn't feel like bass. I mean, empirically oh. on the scope, it measured awesome. But when I listened to it, I just found myself like kind of bored. Huh. You know what I mean? Yeah. And I, I paid it, I paid attention to that, the feeling. This is what we're talking about. The feeling of, mu of music or the feeling of how this hunk of metal is reproducing, you know, the song for you. So I was like kind of sitting there parked in front of the speakers. I'm like, let, let's back off that inductance a little bit. Let's, let's re rework this. So we built another prototype, you know, recalculated some stuff, built it a little differently, put it back up on the bench and measured it. It's like, yeah, well, look, see, it's not as good as that other prototype. Yeah, mm. but okay, don't give up on this puppy yet. Let's listen to it. And then there was something about it where we were just allowing a little bit of saturation in the uh, low end, and it it added this beautiful bloom to things. Mm. It made it just richer and more enticing sounding. Dude, when I listened to that thing, I got goosebumps. Boom. <laughs> okay. My foot was tapping. So there you go. You know so immediately. That's like that's where it. you want to be is like, how do you extract this emotion that you cannot measure? Mm. You just got to try to be in touch with it or be in tune with it. And I don't mean to go all woo woo on you like that, but that's kind of hey, like I, I, where we're at. I understand. You know? I completely get it. So learning over the years, you know, the first thing that first year I was with the company, you know, learning how to listen because, you know, I was just a musician. It's different when you're like critically listening to stuff. I had to learn like, well, what, okay, I can see on paper what a limiter does. You know, you put this level in, you get that level out. And, uh, but why do you use it? You know, and being able to hear like musically what a limiter or compressor does, that's, uh, you know, why would someone want to use this <laughs> besides mm -hmm. just like chopping the level? Right. Um, and then later, you know, how to relate what we hear to what we're measuring and by, and being able to predict it back the other way. Like if I build something that's going to have these artifacts on the measuring bench, it's going to sound like that. Right. So that's, that's something I've, um, yeah. you know, kind of worked on in the last couple decades and, Hopefully cool. you like the sound of where we're yeah, at. No, definitely. <laughs> well, you know, I think I think for me, there's always been a separation between the pro audio people and the audio file. Like, I, forgive me a little bit. I've always kind of, in a sense, looked down a bit on a certain subsection of the audio file community because, you know, I, I can't remember what it was, but I think a little while ago there was a study where somebody used a coat hanger as a wire instead of, let's say, a $500 a foot gold right, plated right, wire. Right. And, the sound was literally exactly the same. So you have this thing where people assume it's like, okay, I have a $100,000 receiver. I've got a $50,000 vinyl turntable. At what point do you feel like, I mean, there's there's a limit to this stuff, right? It's It can't, do you think $100,000 is going to be somehow fundamentally better in terms of this stuff than say five? Well, not from every company. It's it's not you know some some uh, some of these outfits are just multiplying off their build costs by a humongous number, mm. <laughs> and there there are those that think that the more they spend the better sound they get. It's not in, always true. Mm. Um, another thing, like to get that last little nth degree, the last little bit, sometimes it sometimes that really does cost a lot of money. Right. Mm -hmm. And you got to balance this stuff out. So I, I, I get this all the time with the hi-fi products. They're like, Oh yeah, manly. Well, it's only $8,000 for those hundred watt monoblocks. Like they're not expensive enough. Like, and then right. someone will go out and pay $50,000 for some other brand. And, you know, I, I'll look in the, in the box. It's like, man, there's no way that thing costs that much money to make. <laughs> right. You know, it better than anybody. Costs, like their bomb costs probably less than mine and they're charging, you know, a whole bunch more. Um, so that can happen. Or, or another thing, you know, you get the reverse where, um, 
they look inside, they see like we're using, say we're using, you know, the MIT multicaps and they're like, oh, well, yeah, why aren't you using the, the this brand of capacitor, you know, that's way more expensive. And it's like, well, maybe I've heard stories about how unreliable that brand is yeah. from people who repair other products that have those caps in them. Maybe that's a factor because it sure sounds like crap if it's not playing songs at all. Um, <laughs> like if it's broken, so we don't want to build unreliable gear. Or maybe I've done my listening test with the caps that we're using. I really love the way they sound. Mm -hmm. You know, in because it's just one component that's got to work with everything else in the in the sure. unit. You know, so you get that sometimes too, where people are wishing that. I was building more expensive gear, you know, yeah, and then other people are that. like, God, your gear's so expensive. I can't afford it. Right. <laughs> so, yeah. you know, it's just, everything's got to be in balance and mm -hmm. I can be the laziest audiophile on the planet and just play Sonos, you know, in my house, just having songs playing. And I didn't even turn on a tube amplifier today. Right. <laughs> right. But I was just, Which you know, also great. I was just streaming some Fleetwood Mac and, you know, wishing I had been in the USC marching band in 1979. I mean, that's so awesome. <laughs> you know, marching band in rock and roll. Wow. <laughs> yeah. yeah. You know, I'm thinking about other things besides like the bass response or the, well, whatever, you know. Mm -hmm. I, well, I, mean, I always thought that was I, like. I like to listen to music, man. I, I don't like to be an audiophile all the time. Right. I always thought it was so funny that I, I grew up in Denver and there was this um, audiophile store called Listen Up. And I used to go in there just to listen to the $100,000, $200,000 speakers. That was where I discovered B&W, Nautilus, and all of these things. And I would just put my music on and I'd just bring in a CD. And they knew I wasn't going to buy anything, but they humored right. me. You know, I remember one time being in there with, I think it was like $150,000 setup. And they were like, now you're hearing the music as it was intended. And I was thinking to myself, even then, I was like, I know for a fact this was probably mixed on $500 speakers. So to what degree are we manufacturing something, you know, because it's like it, this is as the engineer would have intended it. But how often is an engineer ever mixing anything on a $100,000, $200,000 system, right? It's, they're just yeah, doing whatever well, they have. Let's think about all the cool recording studios we've been in and how awesome the playback can sound in yeah. some of those studios. And then other studios, I've I've been I went to a studio one time to do a demo for an engineer, and I walk in and there there are no surrounds on the speaker cones at all, like they had just rotted away. And we're listening to this, and I'm like, this isn't even functioning correctly. <laughs> right. Like, how are we supposed to hear the difference between these, you know, A to D converters when? your speakers aren't even working right. <laughs> like you need to get them repaired. <laughs> that was crazy. But then here's where I think the audiophile and the pro audio world converge is that um, is in the, in the mastering room. Cause those guys usually have very exotic setups. That's true. They have the big speakers, a yeah. properly designed acoustic environment. True. And, that's where you're really listening critically there. Um, True. I think that most audiophiles presume that engineers listen to NS10s and that's their reference of high fidelity. True. But it's not. As we know, it's their reference to how it's going to sound in a car, which is where yeah. most people listen to music. Mm -hmm. But, you know, you have to, when you're recording, you have to, in, in mastering, you have to be able to uh, predict how that song is going to translate in a car. How is it going to sound like in a big audio file system? What's it going to sound like in just a, a cheap little system or boom box or whatever, you know? Yep. So there, there's all kinds. Of, or how is it going to sound on, you know, little earbuds? Also very That's important. That's important, yeah. too. These little people, guys. Yeah. You know what I mean? So, um, they or how's it going to sound with Apple Music, or how's it going to sound on vinyl? 
or yes. whatever. So in the mastering room, um, those engineers need to, you know, do their final adjustments to the mix so that it will sound as good as it can in all those environments, right? Yeah. Good point. That is true. That is where it converges. Um, I do want to, you know, thank you so much for bearing with me so far. This is the point where I want to switch gears a little bit into a lightning round. So we're going to do a, a quick speed questions, okay? Oh, I, I got a light. Yeah, there's lightning bolts right there. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, the two-powered <laughs> lightning round. Ooh, Hopefully it's the right, right voltage. Or <laughs> uh, <laughs> okay, so for somebody who might want to start out, who, who thinks, hey, I might like to make a pro audio company, Good luck. What advice would you have wh where to begin? Get away while you can. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, where to begin with that is um, you, every day is a brand new adventure. Like, it's a great place to be if you, if you get bored easily because you will never be bored in manufacturing. That's for sure. Um, where to begin, you know, Oh my God, where would I begin? It I can't even imagine starting off today to like how how do you raise the noise and get the message out that you've got this little cool little pro product to sell, you know, probably through social media. So get your marketing together and branding. And that that's something I worked on in the late nineties, very, very much so. What especially with David Manley leaving the com company, my buddy Paul Wolf. Uh, who owned API at the time, he was oh. talking to me. He's like, Ivana, here's what you need to do. You need to, all right, David's in the past and you're in the future. So you need to get all the, get his name off the, you know, designed by David Manley, get that off the mm -hmm. faceplate, get his stories out of the owner's manual, sweep them off the website. You know, you, you bought the Manley brand and you need to market that around you now. You're the future. Wow. So that was like super valuable advice. Um, and one I'd say for someone starting out, you know, get that branding and keep looking towards the future mm. uh, when you're creating that message and defining like, number one, what okay. is this thing and why do I want to buy it? That's like what you have to get that message out in order to sell something to somebody, right? Mm -hmm. That's a, that's a thing is, is tell them why they need to buy it. Okay. All Not right. Just, we're going to, we're okay, going to, it sounds good. All right. Well, it does. Thing. great. But you know, the branding and marketing, I think is real important. And then just internal organization and watching your profitability and costing and all that boring business stuff too. But, there's a lot of people that are good designers that should not be running a company. So maybe, you know, it's hard to start on your own. Maybe people do need to partner together to draw upon the strengths of different folks to help. Makes it's a sense. lot for one person to do. Yeah. All right. Next question. Do you live to work or work to live? Uh, I hope one day I'll get to live. I'm kind of serving <laughs> my time now. <laughs> I, I definitely want to get out and, you know, maybe hike the PCT or go ride my motorbike in, in other countries or something like that. And I need to get off the internet to be able to do that stuff. There, thus, yes. I, need, I need to take a big break. I've been working way too much. Yep. I think a lot of people feel that. All right, next one. Do you feel that you are successful? Do you feel successful today? Yeah, I do. And I I don't need anyone to praise me or say, oh, good job, Ivana. I, I can tell that to myself, and I can feel that. it. It's just like it, sometimes I get to the point, it's too much. I, I want to break. I just want to go live simply <laughs> off the grid or something. You know what yeah. I mean? But as far as su professional success goes, I've I've done well, and at at this point, I'm trying to do more to help others around me, or be That's more wonderful. charitable, or that kind of thing. That is awesome. Thanks. All right, so this this is a this next question is a personal one for me. So I, I like to read a lot of business books, biographies, autobiography. Very fascinated with these types of stories. Um, there's always a pattern when you're reading a book. It's like they were broke, they had nothing. 
And then after they made their first million dollars, they did this. And then I'm like, wait a minute, wait a minute, hold on, hold on, back up. You know, they always gloss over how like the first hundred thousand dollars was made, for example, because, you know, between nothing and Jeff Bezos, there's a lot of stuff that happened. And so as a general thing, what do you have to say about the first 100 K of a business? How is it made? Yeah, man, I there were years where I didn't even pay myself anything. You know, we just survived on business dinners <laughs> paid by the company. And you know what I mean? Yeah. Um, it started very humbly. And the goal was not to get rich. That was not the goal. The goal was to build excellent gear and, you know, the money will sort itself out later on. And I told you that, you know, the way we developed gear, it wasn't developed to a price at the time. So I think developing for the best, most awesome thing first, and then having the derivative products later that are less expensive, that was that was one strategy, you know. But again, it, the profitability of that big badass guy, that was the last thing we were thinking about. Mm. So just and focusing on the quality. And the money will come. You, you, would you, you believe that today still. Yeah. And also the strengths of your relationships with other people in the business too. So, mm -hmm. you know, one thing I'm always honest and I don't lie to people and I don't bullshit people. Mm -hmm. And if, if I say I know something, it's because I know it. And if, and I'm okay, a lesson I learned was like, uh, no, I don't know the answer to that question or or I didn't even hear you. Can you repeat that? Like to to admit that you don't know something is powerful because there's always someone around that you could get the answer, you know. But quality of relationships with your trading partners is essential as well. You know, be a mm. reliable person that that will help you succeed, definitely. Well, that's we need more people like you, I can tell you right <laughs> now. Speak speaking of somebody else that I'm not gonna name that I think you were referencing <laughs> exactly. earlier. Who may be just the polar opposite of that philosophy? Just, just exactly. possibly. Um, yeah, you gotta right, so, take care of people around you, man. You gotta right, pay your bills. I, <laughs> I like the honesty. I'm a big fan. Uh, all right. So, two little tiny questions. All right. So, what's the goal on the next horizon? What's the next big goal? To, to get more, to claim back some more time for myself, definitely. Okay. So, um, purely personal. Okay. Yeah. Um, in uh, company success, like I said, we're we're doing great. We're our biggest year ever. Um, I just paid all my employees giant end of year Christmas bonuses, like bigger than we've ever done before. We gave more. That's wonderful. We gave like thirty thousand dollars to human rights campaign this year, um, with a special massive pride uh, yeah. version that we did for uh, Pride Month in June. Awesome. And you know, that kind of thing. That's just. Trying awesome. to be more, you know, that, you I know, love that. my, I remember my neighbors in Atlanta who, who I worked for at a picture framing shop, you know, I remember him saying like, how much cash do you need? How much money do you need? Like how many more Oriental rugs do I need to buy? Like, <laughs> like this, this, this drive to accumulate that's Steph, what I always ask myself. Well, how many like more how Oriental much? rugs do I need to buy today? Yeah, like, that's that's what know. I've been waking up thinking. Just, <laughs> I, I mean, I'm as far as like Exodus sleep. goes, like yes. how much, how many vacation homes does one need? I mean, True. I don't have any vacation homes. I think about it sometimes. I'm like, why would I even want a vacation home? I just go travel at different places and rock up <laughs> somewhere awesome. else. Well, we always like to end with this question. What is the smartest piece of advice you've ever received? Yeah, well, I told you that the one Paul Wolf said, you know, gave me was looking forward. I think in business, that was one of the most important things for me at the time. I've told you that story is, you mm -hmm. know, keep the importance of branding and keeping looking towards the future, not looking towards the past. That's one that comes to mind. Hey, that's a great one. If you want to go out on that, I'm okay with it. Unless you got a better one. Uh, well, some, no of, pressure. some of the life lessons I've, I've just had to teach myself, you know, like it's okay to say that you don't know something. 
you know, after, you know, go to private high school and fancy Ivy League school where you're being graded on how much you know and how much you remember. Mm -hmm. When you get out of school, it's okay to change that behavior. And, you know, someone asks you a question you don't know, it's okay to say, I don't know the answer to that, but I'm going to go try to figure it out for you or go find out. Cool. Well, thank you so much for taking the time. Um, really, really a pleasure to have you. I'm really thank glad you, so you did this. Um, I, I learned a lot. It's, it's been wonderful. So uh, with that, I am going to encourage everybody out there who needs any kind of pro audio gear or or high, fi high fidelity audio to go to the website. It's manly.com, right? M-A-N-L-E-Y.com. Correct. Uh, so... Thank you so much, Ivana. And with that, podcast over. Thanks for listening to the Beat the Often Path podcast. If you've been enjoying this show, please like, comment, share, subscribe on Apple Podcasts, subscribe to me on YouTube. It would mean the world to me. Also, do you have an unusual success story or do you know someone who does? Well, please recommend them to me. They could be a future guest on this show. Maybe they've rolled the largest boulder down the mountains of Tibet. Or maybe they built the world's largest chicken farm in Madagascar. The point is, I don't know what I don't know. So I'm looking for inspiration and unusual success stories. So help me by being a part of this adventure. I'm looking to grow this podcast with you. Thanks again for listening. <laughs>